It is April the 30th, 2023, right? And this is the future <laughs> of <so>. photography. <laughs> <laughs> Last thing I heard. The future of photography. Well, there, there I am. I'm gone for a week and I forgot everything. No <laughs> retention whatsoever. It's the age, well, I guess. <laughs> That's what it is. Uh, yeah, or it's just not that important to have those memories. You remember what you need to remember. Well, I hope so. So I was gone for a week. Um, been on vacation up in the north of Germany, North Sea on a small island, smallish island, um, with sheep, wind, and that's pretty much it. <laughs> it's wonderful. <laughs> it was wonderful. It was low, yeah. low um, impact low kind light. of thing. Yeah. No, <laughs> light was good. Light was great. Um, and now I'm here for one, two, three, four, five, five days, um, and then I'll, I'm off to the next thing, which is a, which is a photo workshop that I'll hold. Um, so, and how are things going with you? You have well, good. Uh, we are uh, well into our, um, you know, third episode of our show. I am about to finish this week, uh, editing as I go, and uh, we'll begin the uh, fourth episode very soon. So, within a hair's breadth, we're going to be halfway through the show. Um, and that takes me off location for a few weeks, so I can edit from home. Uh, for a while. And, that, would, that, uh, that would actually be my question. You as a director, I, I remember times when there was a cutter, was dedicated person to cut the things. But nowadays with pretty much the edit happening on a laptop or possibly even in a web browser online somewhere, um, are you the one doing most of the editing now or how does this work? Uh, the way it's structured with the TV show, because we, we have to work so fast uh, at assembling, we, we work with two, often sometimes three, editors oh, wow. uh, who will, uh, as I shoot, um, my uh, script, uh, scripty, as we call them, the continuity person will take copious notes uh, of mm -hmm. what takes that I like or not and how I see it when I'm on set. And then I will have uh, a lot of conversations with the editor, my editor on the particular episode, uh, which is, you know, as I'm shooting, I will check in with her in this case every day. Um, and we will discuss the kind of the, the, the kind of pace and we get timings before we shoot and, and adjust, because in TV, unlike movies, you have to adhere, certainly in broadcast, not so much in streaming, to a certain parameter, uh, so you don't want to be massively over time or under time, because that creates other kind of issues, which you can address, right. but it, but it's a problem. And, and so they will kind of assemble it and do as much fine editing as they can. Obviously, if I know them and they know the show and they know me, th th there's a shorthand there. They'll know how to read my dailies. It's, it's, like, a, it's like a band that's been playing together uh, for, for years. Yeah. That kind of it's thing. like yeah. that. And then as soon as I finish, um, within a few days, I will jump in and then we will edit together. Uh, we will use a system uh, currently called Evercast, which uh, allows kind of the sharing... Um, of the screen uh, in real time with the editor there, and uh, it's very you know it's different than when I used to go to the editing room and look at the back of the <laughs> editor's head and sit on the couch and call out notes. This is actually much preferred, and um, you know the editors now are working from home. They they don't have yeah. to have a cutting room, and and the assistant is working from another home or office or whatnot. So. Um, yes, everything is online. Everything is is uh, uh, certainly put together that way. That Lots of virtual music. virtual yeah. collaboration. That's I, I like this. I mm -hmm. like this. Sounds. It works very efficiently. It's really great, and it has little or no bearing on uh, the final outcome. It's it's actually works well. I Interesting, because 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 I've I've heard like bo bosses say you have to be in the office because you cannot do any creative <coughs> work if you're not. But this seems to be a good counterpoint there that you yeah. can do creative work. Yes, I, I mean I, you know, there's certainly 
uh, two sides to that. I mean, you know, we have a production office and sure. uh, a writer's room, and there, there's very there's a lot of advantages to spitballing in person in terms of conceptual right. thinking and and the randomness of the human experience that I think. Uh, is not as um, random uh, online. I think on, when people are online, they generally will have a much more rigid schedule. In other words, let's get to it. We have to do this because nobody right. wants to just hang out, right? Unlike us. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but, 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 you know, what I'm saying is that there is advantage and disadvantage of both. Um, and I think we're going to see in the workplace that kind of split where people will come in for a while and they work from home for a while. Also, it gets, for some people, it gets rather lonely and rather dispiriting working by yourself constantly. Just just have that. And if you have, if you have children, there's that um, to deal with, uh, which can be significant. Um, mm -hmm. You know, so uh, I don't so, know. So, so I'm, I, I have this interesting dynamic because... Um, I teach photography. That's one of the things I do in, in, in various forms. And, of course, in the podcasts, um, which are split between news and some thoughts and philosophy and teaching and so on. But there's also part of my business is training, is consulting. Um, I have a couple of books under my belt. So there's, there's teaching there. Um, and then, of course, there's the photo travel that I do, which also has a, a teaching component mm -hmm. to it every time. And uh, I'm just in the middle of preparing for this workshop next week, mm -hmm. which, which is kind of the, the biggest thing. And that's, that's, that was kind of the idea to talk a bit about the whole teaching aspect in photography. Um, and uh, it's interesting because I've now been doing this for, oh, I don't even know, since 2005, 2006. So quite a while. And it... It's a learning process, and it still is every time I do this. But the the workshop next week is kind of the the big the big one, the the one that people tend to <laughs> um, tend to structure their year by, because it's once oh. a year. Yeah. Um, there's um, next week there'll be 32 people, nice. and we'll meet That's in an old size. abbey, which is in the, the, the south of Germany. It's not it's not a a religious place anymore it's now a place of education so they have they have rooms for people to stay in they serve food they have the, the space to um to they have several rooms there's parallel other workshops going on at the same time about completely unrelated topics um there might be one about plants and one about mushrooms and one about ancient scripture and one of, I don't know, lo lots of interesting. So do, do they organize it uh, in terms of um, how to manage the resources in terms of food and all of that they, stuff? They, in our case, uh, in our case, we're kind of a bit of a special case. We uh, run the workshop, but they provide the infrastructure. Yeah. And, oh, great. Uh, that makes it everything else. So, so they keep, they keep our, uh, our backs free of all that. So we, we can <clears throat> fully, uh, talk f f fully dive into the teaching. When I say we, this is a workshop I hold together with my uh, podcast partner Boris, Boris Nienke, who we uh, we've been doing the Happy Shooting Workshop, German photo workshop uh, uh, podcast, German photo podcast since two thousand six, and we've uh, we've done this workshop since two thousand nine. So it's been an annual occurrence for like fifteen years now. Can and I ask you something about sure, teaching? Go ahead. Just generally, just, um, you know, I've had the opportunity of teaching early in my career, uh, uh, teaching some photography, um, teaching directing. Um, and my question really is about how it informs you. How much learning do you get? Oh, more teaching? than the participants, for sure. Yeah, that's where I'm getting at. Uh, it, yes. Because you have to question everything that you are putting forth, you have to kind of dig deeper and go down whatever kind of foundational aspects of what you're yes. trying to communicate uh, to inspire. Definitely. And in addition to that, with a group that size, it's, 
it's an interesting it has to be an interesting mix of different kinds of teaching because there, there will be classroom style of course we have one week it starts at eight in the morning ends at 7 p.m usually goes into the night so it's five days monday through friday of like almost 24 7 photography so um and i'll be exhausted at the end for <laughs> sure um, but it has to be a bit of a mix so we have a, a, a schedule and some of those uh, slots are classroom uh stuff about about image composition, about light, like basics that, mm -hmm. um, because there will always be some uh, new photographers on this workshop. We're looking for a third new people every year. Um, but then one, one important part that has turned into kind of the, the, the whole, the, the most important part of the structure is group projects. And what we're looking at is groups of, two, three, four people who self-select a project. Um, of course, we discuss. We're there to guide and to look over their shoulder and to give them pointers. And um, and, this, and throughout the entire week, like two hours a day is reserved for that. And then at the end, on, a, on the Friday night, last evening, there will be a project presentation. And it's not just among the group. No, all the other workshops the mushroom <laughs> workshops, the old scripture workshops. Uh, everyone will be there and will kind of judge what we've been doing for this week. And that's an in intense uh, motivation for people to... Yeah, you, putting, there's it, always, putting your work out there is always scary, yes. And, and for, for many people, that's the first time they do that in this mm. kind of an uh, intensity. And it's, there's an interesting thought about the intrinsic versus the extrinsic motivation. So sure. um, if you look at, of course, people are intrinsically motivated. They come to this workshop, they sign up, they pay for it. So there's, there is an in built-in motivation. But then our job is to kind of ratchet it up a bit with some extrinsic motivation. And that certainly does the job to the point where people if we, we don't need a third new people, we would sell this thing out every year with uh, people who have been there before because everyone wants that rush. I have a follow-up follow -up question here. Sure. Um, can composition be taught? We have one vehicle that, again, leads itself to, lends itself to, to the self-teaching of this, and that is... Um, assignments around things. We have a, a daily assignment and we have like specific assignments around the classroom stuff. And uh, we have reviews, group reviews of those. So people will, again, be kind of forced to have their pictures up on <laughs> the screen and uh, and talk about them and look at, look at the photography of others and talk about it and have their own pictures talked about by others. Which you know, I, always, I, I do find it interesting. Um, I think you can teach people how to see light, how to look at light. Sure. How to, how to look at how light bounces off different textures uh, and, and how the energy of light uh, uh, will determine what's interesting to people. So it Obviously, that's part sure. of photography. It's just finding what is interesting, and within. it's 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 attention management that All you do that. as a photographer. Yeah, yeah. But composition, um, yes, one could learn the rule of thirds, balanced composition, center punching. You know what I mean? Extreme formats, all of that stuff. But I have found that you can learn it intellectually, but unless you have a personal aesthetic that it's very, very difficult to have somebody understand what makes a great composition uh, that requires no thought, just an instinct on what works in a frame and not. And I, I have found that over and over again, that you could teach all the mechanics, you could teach about life, oh, yeah. you could teach about subject. Composition is something else. <laughs> yeah, you, I, I, I fully agree. You cannot really teach composition in that 
in that respect, um, you can teach all the formalisms, all the where to place things, yeah. how the spacing around a subject works, and uh, and and light and dark and color and how that influences attention in a photo. This is all teachable, but it it the 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 your own. I'd even say feeling, just a gut feeling about is this a good composition or not, will have to develop over years, really. A, a lifetime, pretty much. And yeah. the interesting thing is that, of course, what you will do as a, as a viewer is you will always filter anything you look at through your own experiences, through your own baggage yeah. that you carry around. And, and that means that even even a, a slightly different bringing up in a different culture will make you Certainly. look at things in a different way so so i think that's an important thing to learn is that you will always have a target audience that you shoot for if you want to have impact with your photography it helps to understand their culture it helps to even mm -hmm. and that goes and that goes down to i'm not even talking culture as in this person is from Europe and this person is from the US. No, this can go down to the village or the family. I mean, sure. culture is very, very specific. It's like food. There's a lot of very, very interesting uh, right. connections between what tastes good, what looks good, what plates are attractive uh, to different cultures, even locally, yes. Um, I'm, I'm always interested in the kind of experience of photographers who don't have the time to think about a composition. Obviously, if you bring your 4x5, 8x10 camera out into the forest and plant it and are very considered about what makes a really fantastic image, and you consider it. But then you think about photographers like James Natchway, who are working under war conditions, who consistently bring back a frame that tells a complete story and they do it so fast. You know, the difference between moving the camera or, or using a lens that's slightly longer or m moving a lens slightly to the left or right would completely transform the image and the story they are trying to convey. And so those kinds of instinctive things, I always thought, you can't learn that. That's something that is a gift or it's not. Like Latonin as a musician. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. It, it, uh, um, yes. Yes. That is instinct. And that instinct or intuition comes from, I would say, muscle memory and just doing it a lot. Because then you will... Uh, it's, a, it's, a matter, it's a matter of patterns. And rec recognizing them and being able to yes, to, yeah. to 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 use them in certain uh, contexts. I've been the the thing about this abbey is the the reason I'm doing it there is because for the 15 years before I started doing that photo workshop, I was a participant on a workshop there every year, and it was a jazz workshop because part of my my life is uh, is in music. So I've been playing instruments there. And the same exact same thing happens when you play a jazz tune and it's your turn to solo. Because yeah. you, have, you have a framework, a jazz tune has a framework, mm -hmm. it's a very sure. structured uh, part yeah. of music, and then all of a sudden that structure keeps going on by the others, but you are now free to do things over that structure that fits in that structure. And... That's where you need experience and intuition. I was never really good at that, so uh, <laughs> this is this is something um, that I'm. I think I'm certainly better at in photography. But it is it is the same thing. You you move within a, a given framework. Um, in, with, with the same in photography, you have exposure, you have uh, aperture, you have composition, you have a frame that you work in, and so on. So you have a you have a given structure, and then the placement of things in that frame, and uh, the, the choice of of perspective, and a choice of background, and a choice of uh, lots of different variables in there. Um, that comes from experience or from. That, that's you, what intuition is, I think. So thinking about this in context of the future of photography, um, do you think that it is possible 
to program a camera to nudge you <laughs> one way or another in terms of composition. And I think, you know, these ca cars that that will say, oh, you're getting too close to the lines on the highway, self-correct mm. and th those kinds of things. Is it possible to have a setting that indicates rule of thirds, you know what I mean? And, and guides you and helps we've, you. We've already had something like this in the 90s, um, which was a very crude form of this. In the 90s, Kodak had a series of cameras out with like compact cameras where without a viewfinder, so you, you'd be uh, composing on the bigger display as is yeah. usual now with many cameras. Um, and they had uh, d different templates in that so you could oh, choose like from that. from several different group shots for example and <laughs> it would it would uh, overlay an outline of a group and there was a landscapes where it would uh, like sunset and it would overlay uh, here's a line where you put the horizon and here's a little circle <laughs> where you put the sun and this guy i mean really crude and really almost like yeah of course anti anti creative in, sure. in a sure. way um I could certainly imagine that you'd have a an AI or something in your camera that would that you could tell. Hey, by the way, I'm doing a group shot, or it would even recognize that, and then yeah. uh, it would it would it would look over your shoulder or through your camera mm -hmm. and say, "Okay, that person to the right needs to move in a bit further. Otherwise, it'll be it'll have a lamppost sticking out of his head and these kind of things." I think this is certainly doable. Absolutely. Um, Maybe not now, but in five years for sure. So How about five months. <laughs> yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah, <laughs> things things are going to get weird pretty fast. That's I think a given right They're Pretty now. weird already. Um, um, in terms of teaching, um, yeah. I think it is still the best way as a human to learn is still the the face to face hands on approach. I've done some virtual stuff there, um, but. Just that group setting, and, and it has a bit to do with like we've now all been through the pandemic, and we've been all doing lots of virtual, and uh, people are kind of hungry for the for the real experience, um, and uh, that's one aspect. But we do things, for example, like like we set up a little bit of a competition by. Uh, there, there, there's, there, there will be a printer corner, so we'll have some just some simple. Canon selfie dr uh, printers, small postcard size printers that uh, everyone can use as much as they want. And we'll have some big walls with needles that you can pin photos on. And um, so people are not just encouraged to share their work, put it on in a physical form, but also pretty much they, they're supposed to flood that wall. At the end of those five days, there's three or four of these big walls full of pictures. And um, so there's a bit of a almost a, a bit of a pride thing to show your work and uh, make that something special. So these kind of experiences at this point are very hard to replicate outside a, of, a, of a personal attendance. Here, here's another question. Have you, in, in the years that you've been doing this, noticed a evolution or devolution in terms of Photography, in terms of approach to photography, the kinds of images that are that are being um, produced and, and, and printed or displayed, it have you seen a difference? Um, general is a generalized question of seeing patterns emerging that have shifted over the course of your experience. Well, the the fact that some of the participants have been there for. 10 or more times and they know their way around the workshop and how this whole thing feels and how it how it uh, how it evolves um, I, I've watched several people over the years uh, evolve and uh, I, th I think some of the changes that I see are tool induced yeah. the tools change, different cameras we, we're pretty much done the workshop starting pre-smartphone photography mm -hmm. um, and now that is that's a given smartphones are there and they're good and they are being used as tools and sometimes as serious photography tools. Um, so the different tools certainly will 
I, I don't want to say dictate, but they will enable different styles. So and that is what happening. A, Sorry, what, about person, what about personal aesthetics? That That's at the base of my question. Has, uh, has aesthetics I, shifted or changed in any significant ways that you noticed? Well, again, we've been doing this for 15 years. Um, with individuals, for sure. Mm -hmm. But that's just a personal growth process sure. over, mm -hmm. over the years. Um, a general thing, it's hard for me to say that or see that because, again, we have a third uh, new photographers every year, which, um, which means that some of the workshop is about just learning photography from scratch, from the start, um, learning the basic concepts and so on. And there's not much new in that. That's a process that everyone has to go through. But a, in, a general, uh, in a general thing, there's a bit more editing, I think. Mm -hmm. So, how did, how did you learn photography? Oh, entirely self-taught. Yeah, uh, just, me too. Just out of curiosity, I've I've learned photography because I was curious um, how th because I'm curious how things work, and I've done probably the same development as many. I've approached it from the technology side, of course, because these machines with buttons and displays are cool and fun. Um, and then I've I got bored with that part, and then I started digging into how does this work on a psychological level? How does this work on a on an aesthetic level, on a creative level, um, where are the boundaries there? So, yeah. Yeah, I, I, I was self-taught too. I learned out of the Time Life photography book series, which, you know, maybe 40 mm -hmm. years ago was probably the only real massive tome about how to learn. There wasn't a lot of books on photography at that time. And I, I, I bought a camera, I bought an enlarger, I bought chemicals, mm -hmm. I bought paper, yeah. and I just did it out of the books. I put myself in a, shot a roll, put myself in a closet and started to load it. And within five or six minutes, I'm like, oh, I can see my hands. Yep. <laughs> All that light leaking under the, oh, well, I guess that you didn't know. work out too well. And, and it was just one of those, just starting to make every mistake you can. But no teacher, <laughs> nothing, until I got an image that I could print. And You know, I had, I had an, an uncle who was into photography, and he never taught me anything. It was just, but, but yeah. he had this, this uh, subscription to some German photo magazine, and um, and he just, I inherited like a big stack of these magazines from him. And it was, yeah, again, very techie focused, of course, very gear review kind of sure. thing that, that we still have. Um, so I didn't learn too much about photography from that. But then Curiosity, I had a good friend who was also into photography. So the two of us, almost the same age, we bought, DSL, uh, we bought SLRs um, in the same year. And then we, I learned to, to develop film um, not, not by the magazines or anyone teaching me, but by the, by the, by the leaflet that comes with the chemicals yeah. and, the, and the developer <laughs> yeah, thing. Exactly. So, yeah. so I read that and said, okay, this is, okay, takes this dilution in five minutes and so on. And then we just went for it. And then uh, we got some photo paper and didn't have an enlarger. So we made... 35 millimeter contacts on a, on the floor in a broom closet with a bare bulb yeah. at the ceiling and then then we we just put take take the glass out of an image frame and put that on top so it would be flush and then just turn on the light for a few seconds and uh, and then develop that and uh, I still have a few stamp size 35 millimeter contacts um, yeah. From back then, that was I was probably fifteen back then. So that's how this whole thing started. Yeah, yeah. So uh, it's interesting, you know. The teacher is self-taught. <laughs> uh, yeah, i i would I would venture I would venture uh, to say that a lot of people who are self-taught in something might be as good as people who have been to a school for it, um, just because they 
they have a lot of intrinsic motivation and curiosity. And also, that. they end up making every single possible mistake. Yes, <laughs> and yes. It, and that mistake is like raw. It's like you remember. Oh yeah. Uh, I turned on that bulb to make the contact prints for three more seconds, and it's black. Yeah. So you don't do that anymore. You know what I mean? You, like, it's not like reading. Turn it on for three seconds. You feel it more. I think it's making that mistakes. Making mistakes is the most essential part of learning. Absolutely. Um, I I remember last year. Was it last year or the year before? On this on this Abbey workshop, um, a group had a project. They wanted to do. They wanted to figure out how to do um, black and white positives, <laughs> not negatives, but <laughs> positives. So black and white slides, oh, yeah. positive <laughs> slides. And but but they didn't go and buy the chemistry for it. They um, tried to figure it out by googling and finding others who had made mistakes there. And they, for the entire week, they tried to get the process down with an in intermediate exposure step and whatever. Um, tried like three different chemistries because two of them didn't really work and they had a result at the last day. Uh, they went through a lot of pain, but they totally know how mm -hmm. this works now. And it wasn't perfect, it was, but it was good enough to see, okay, this is an actual positive that you guys yeah. get out of this uh, yeah. film. And uh, I was I was really proud of them because they ended up having probably one of the most important ph photography learning experiences of their lives. So it was really good. Yeah, positive black and white. That's I have I have still some very nice positive slides that I did a very interesting tonal uh, relationship um, yep. because you never get absolute clear white because of the base, right? So it's always a, basically a low contrast image that's very beautiful. So. Um, oh, and 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 I am in the in the middle of preparing one project for that because one thing we started a few years ago, and I think it this is becoming more and more important now that things go more virtual and more artificial intelligence and so on, and, so on, and that is a maker project around photography. So mm. we had. I started this with making your own full, no, making your own four by five pinhole camera. So I organized like black cardboard and we spent two hours in a room, the entire group, everyone with scissors and tape and stuff and putting that together, making your own pinhole out of uh, some aluminum foil. And, and uh, that was, uh, people were kind of a bit, taken aback it's like why are we this is a photography workshop not a not a crafts workshop but in the end everyone had not just made a camera they also had taken a picture with it and we sat together and developed them and um this turned to be turned out to be a really important thing to do something with your own hands and then the last sure. last year we we ratcheted up a notch by making a front bokeh generator can you imagine what that would be? <laughs> no. <laughs> so I noticed over the last five, six years that uh, in, in magazines um, you often see photos where you have some lights close to the camera in the out of focus, which, mm -hmm. again, might be just a light bulb or an LED or something. And uh, it, it adds atmosphere and it might be uh, might be might serve as a frame around a subject. And um, so we ended up doing a little electronics project. We <laughs> we had a little board and some LEDs and cables coming off, and everyone uh, went home with a little box that you can <laughs> kind of hold in front of your camera and, and generate some interesting looking nice front yeah. color. Yeah, okay. and, and you can also do it with glass and oh, you need many ways to do that. So, uh, and this year again, I've, I've yeah, I've ordered this. This time it's going to be something made out of wood, and I cannot release. I cannot say what it is because it's a secret. So, but yeah, recently I I had read on one of the photo. It could be lens scratch or pixel. Uh, about someone who had traded 
uh, a camera. They were in Cuba and bought a one of those old handmade big format cameras that that a street vendor had put together with you know an enlarger lens and oh yeah you know really have and and paid him for it because th- that guy wanted to buy a digital camera so they made a deal gave him money for a digital camera and brought this huge box that was you know plywood and nails and, and uh, they showed the photographs of that he had taken they were so beautiful you know what i mean they, it was an aesthetic completely connected to the camera in other words only that camera could have taken that photograph in that way yes and that's very interesting in terms of these DIY projects because not only do they teach you about the essence of photography, you know, light, lens, photosensitive material, but they also encourage, like there's a Hungarian photographer, I'm blanking on his name, who is famous for building small 35 millimeter cameras out of kind of junk and you know, hobbles this together. And his work, I mean, he, I think he was very active in the 60s and 70s. I'll try and find him for one of our podcasts for a pick. They are absolutely astonishing images. And, and, and the same with when, when, you, when you get people to, for the first time, play with film photography and develop their own photos, you end up having the DIY aspect of it makes you have a stronger bond with the general field of photography. So, I agree. hundred so percent. That's, yeah. that's, that's what we're doing. Like making people happy, teaching them something. Yeah. And uh, it, yeah. Yeah. It's funny as, uh, as I have explored AI, as, as you know, in terms of image creation, um, I'm getting pretty sophisticated about it. If I don't say so myself, um, <laughs> but, but the connection with the tools are not the same. Yep. These, it comes out of a process, and it's not unlike painting, but it, it's even with painting, there's the tactile aspect of brush, paint, texture, canvas um, that connects you to, to the piece. This is the electronic relationship is, is significantly different. Doesn't mean the images don't have impact or are not emotional. Oh, and um, it doesn't mean the images don't have soul, uh, which is often does, quoted in this context. No, not, I, I don't buy that at all. That's really yeah. in the intention and outcome of the image. But in terms of the process and the artist, there is something so beautiful about holding a camera that you like even an old one. Uh, I still have my father's Rolleiflex that he gave me, and I love taking pictures with him. It connects me with him in a way. You know, he's long gone, but but there is something special uh, about the lenses of this Rolleiflex. They're still square image. Okay, it comes down even to things like uh, like the shutter, the sound of the shutter. Yes, 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 yes. So. Those those are precious things for photography that you cannot capture when you're working purely digitally. And as you know, I'm, I'm you know, very into working digitally. But um, that does not mean that I do not continue to work in um, what I would consider a more tool-oriented <laughs> I- IRL in real life. In real life. The, the interesting thing, and, and I, I had uh, brought this up on uh, our podcast the other week, where I took a photograph, uh, uh, it was an iPhone photograph, and married it, processed it through mid-journey to end up with something that was really very interesting, really magical, and just took my composition, I adjusted the weights and the parameters, and ended up with something that was born through real photography or iPhone photography, but ended up to be a marriage of those things. And I think we're going to see more and more of that because that is very interesting, um, I think, to not only me, but many, many artists uh, of training their own models in a way and training their own aesthetic. We're going to see less 
general models in that you know, and more about your own work. You know, one thing one thing that I have not explicitly integrated into that into this year's Abbey workshop is AI in photography because for for one one main reason, because things move so fast right now that it yeah. really is virtually mm -hmm. impossible. But uh, I'm pretty sure, and I'll, I'll leave space open for discussions <coughs> around that for sure. Um, and I expect discussions around it. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, it, it, it's here to stay. It's here to stay. My <laughs> workshop is here to stay too. Um, <laughs> how about some picks of the week? You brought us a photographer who is Carmen Winnant. Uh, this is a very interesting um, look at a different approach to photography altogether. Uh, it, it, it takes printed articles. Uh, it, 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 it captures a story. It, it's really about violence and women and all of, uh, all of the kind of culture that surrounded it. But these are images that are not intrinsically aesthetic, but capture, put together, a whole story and culture of something. And, and uh, it, 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 I think it encourages some um, to not be precious about anything, you know what I mean? Taking pictures of pictures, taking pictures of posters, taking pictures of graphics. Um, and, and just putting together it in more of a collage style has a power of its own. It, it um, does. Um, some of these pictures do remind me of the Beckers, for example, with uh, yeah. their collection of industrial buildings. Um, it, it's, a, it's a mixture of collections and yeah. documentation. I like this, yeah. Yeah, it's just a different way of looking at photography altogether. Um, Thanks for and sharing it, you that. Know, it, it, it also, you know, I'll, I'll bring it up to you because Adrian and I were talking about this. Um, I'll, I'll bring it back to AI as I always do, but <laughs> that, that, that copyright um, lately, I think this will all work through in the courts and I'll throw it to you as a question because I asked the same of Adrian. Um, you can't copyright uh, an image that is made purely of AI, at least currently, that's what they're saying. Uh, and so my question was, if I generate an image and I take a photograph of that image pinned on the wall, can I copyright the photograph? <laughs> well, there, there have been big law cases around, like, um, I don't know, of, 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 of these can, exactly these kind of things where one artist will take... Oh, uh, yeah. an artwork of another artist and then change it in some way but this is your medium. own work this is your own warhol work. warhol for example with a sure. i think i think that is still not decided by no, this day no it's not it's still right. happening yeah but but i'm i'm talking about and, and that's pursuant to this pick of the week where you photograph an article a page from time magazine for example which is a copyright um piece of work, put it in a collection, that collection becomes something else. But if yeah. you take a photograph of your own work, is that copyrightable? Very interesting case is going to work through the court. Nothing to do with... A copyright case generation. against myself? Hmm. No, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I'll try to sue myself. Anyway, that's um, my pick. Okay, my pick is something that is not necessarily a recommendation, just something interesting I found, and you might get a kick out of that. Um, it's a Kickstarter project um, that reminds me of the good old days of filmmaking. Um, it's called the Vertigo Lens Turret. Someone is building <laughs> a lens turret for digital well, movie cameras. So mm. what, what, what we have is, a, is a, like a revolver with three mounts for three different lenses and we've seen this since the beginning of sure uh film where instead of having a zoom lens you'd have multiple prime lenses that you can quickly swap out this way and someone is trying to build that with the help of kickstarter um do you see a place for that is that something that you'd be interested in as a as a, as a director as a filmmaker the uh, quick answer is absolutely not. <laughs> <laughs> I was expecting that. <laughs> it's, 
the quality of zoom lenses these days, if you need a quick change in focal length um, and you need to work quickly, then yeah, zoom lenses I think will probably take that spot. But I can see this being so front heavy, number one. Number two, <laughs> how do you protect these things? Uh, this is like, I, you know, the camera weighs nothing compared to the lens mounts. And, right. and uh, how fast does it, you know, can you change a lens? Uh, I'm, I don't see it. I'm sorry. I have an old wow. Bolex. Uh, yeah, you know, that, exactly. That, that, that's what I was thinking of, like 18 millimeter or 16 millimeter Bolex that, cameras. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, I was when I looked at that. I, that was exactly my thoughts. It's like I don't know if this mm. solves if this solves a problem that people actually have. So. Uh, on a on a parallel note, I just saw a Kickstarter, but I I couldn't capture it. It's it's a you know obviously early on, but it is a full color, 1080p, um, night vision, um, camera, mm -hmm. uh, full color that'll work in like military grade. Mm -hmm. um, I think that could be very interesting. It, yeah, possibly. Well, even though if you, even though if you look at the capabilities of modern backlit sensors by Sony, for example, they're all, almost night vision yeah. um, with their, I don't know, millions of ISO. <laughs> so. I don't know. <sighs> We'll see. <laughs> right. Well, I, I do. I do enjoy the, the the smartphone switching to a night mode and yeah. kind of automatically. It's, yeah, it's a different look. Together. Very different look. Yeah. Anyway, that I think brings us to the end of today's future photography. Um, I think Adrian will be back next week. So uh, until then, I will. I will keep preparing stuff and hope. I hope that all the tools and supplies for the craft part of the workshop will arrive in time um, I, I still need to get some spray paint <laughs> spray paint it's always important color all right um, we'll be back in a week from now I guess um, you can find us online at the thefuturephotography.com or wherever you get your podcasts the future of photography with TFOP everyone take care till next week Bye-bye. You've been listening to The Future of Photography. Subscribe to the show wherever you get your other podcasts. Find the show notes and more information at thefutureofphotography.com.